This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Alarms and Discursions by G. K. Chesterton. Section 10, Chapters 28 through 30. The Wheel. In a quiet and rustic, though fairly famous, church in my neighborhood, there is a window supposed to represent an angel on a bicycle. It does definitely and indisputably represent a nude youth sitting on a wheel, but there is enough complication in the wheel and sanctity, I suppose, in the youth, to warrant this working description. It is a thing of florid Renaissance outline and belongs to the highly pagan period which introduced all sorts of objects into ornament. Personally, I can believe in the bicycle more than in the angel. Men, they say, are now imitating angels in their flying machines. That is, not in any other respect that I have heard of. So perhaps the angel on the bicycle, if he is an angel, and if it is a bicycle, was avenging himself by imitating man. If so, he showed that high order of intellect which is attributed to angels in the medieval books, though not always, perhaps, in the medieval pictures. For wheels are the mark of a man quite as much as wings are the mark of an angel. Wheels are the things that are as old as mankind and yet strictly peculiar to man, that are prehistoric but not prehuman. A distinguished psychologist who is well acquainted with physiology has told me that parts of himself are certainly levers, while other parts are probably pulleys but that, after feeling himself carefully all over, he cannot find a wheel anywhere. The wheel, as a mode of movement, is a purely human thing. On the ancient estrusion of Adam, which, like much of the rest of his costume, has not yet been discovered, the heraldic emblem was a wheel, passant. As a mode of progress, I say it is unique. Many modern philosophers, like my friend before mentioned, are ready to find links between man and beast, and to show that man has been in all things the blind slave of his mother earth. Some, of a very different kind, are even eager to show it, especially if it can be twisted to the discredit of religion. But even the most eager scientists have often admitted in my hearing that they would be surprised if some kind of cow approached them moving solemnly on four wheels. Wings, fins, flappers, claws, hooves, webs, trotters, and all these, the fantastic families of the earth, come against us and close around us, fluttering and flapping and rustling and galloping and lumbering and thundering. But there is no sound of wheels. I remember dimly, if indeed I remember aright, that in some of those dark prophetic pages of scripture that seem of cloudy purple and dusky gold, there is a passage in which the seer beholds a violent dream of wheels. Perhaps this was indeed the symbolic declaration of the spiritual supremacy of man. Whatever the birds may do above, or the fishes beneath his ship, man is the only thing to steer the only thing to be conceived as steering. He may make the birds his friends if he can. He may make the fishes his gods if he chooses. But most certainly he will not believe a bird at the masthead, and is hardly likely that he will even permit a fish at the helm. He is, as Swinburne says, helmsman and chief, and he is literally the man at the wheel. The wheel is an animal that is always standing on its head, only it does it so rapidly that no philosopher has ever found out which is its head. Or, if the phrase be felt as more exact, it is an animal that is always turning head over heels and progressing by this principle. Some fish, I think, turn head over heels, 
supposing them, for the sake of argument, to have heels. I have a dog who nearly did it, and I did it once myself when I was very small. It was an accident, and as delightful novelist Mr. D. Morgan would say, it never can happen again. Since then no one has accused me of being upside down, except mentally, and I rather think that there is something to be said for that, especially as typified by the rotary symbol. A wheel is the sublime paradox. One part of it is always going forward, the other part always going back. Now this, as it happens, is highly similar to the proper condition of any human soul or any political state. Every sane soul or state looks at once backwards and forwards, and even goes backwards to come on. For those interested in revolt, as I am, I only say meekly that one cannot have a revolution without revolving. The wheel, being a logical thing, has reference to what is behind as well as what is before. It has, as every society should have, a part that perpetually leaps helplessly at the sky and a part that perpetually bows down its head into the dust. Why should people be so scornful of us who stand on our heads? Bowing down one's head in the dust is a very good thing, the humble beginning of all happiness. When we have bowed our heads in the dust for a little time, the happiness comes, and then, leaving our heads in the humble and reverent position, we kick up our heels behind in the air. That is the true origin of standing on one's head, and the ultimate defense of paradox. The wheel humbles itself to be exalted, only it does it a little quicker than I do. 555. Life is full of a ceaseless shower of small coincidences, too small to be worth mentioning except for a special purpose, often too trifling even to be noticed any more than we notice one snowflake falling on another. It is this that lends a frightful plausibility to all false doctrines and evil fads. There are always such crowds of accidental arguments for anything. If I said suddenly that historical truth is generally told by red-haired men, I have no doubt that ten minutes' reflection, in which I decline to indulge, would provide me with a handsome list of instances in support of it. I remember a riotous argument about Bacon and Shakespeare, in which I offered quite at random to show that Lord Rosebery had written the works of Mr. W. B. Yeats. No sooner had I said the words than a torrent of coincidences rushed upon my mind. I pointed out, for instance, that Mr. Yeats' chief work was The Secret Rose. This may easily be paraphrased as The Quiet or Modest Rose, and so, of course, as The Primrose. A second after, I saw the same suggestion in the combination of Rose and Bury. If I had pursued the matter, who knows, but I might have been a raving maniac by this time. We trip over these trivial repetitions and exactitudes at every turn, only they are too trivial even for conversation. A man named Williams did walk into a strange house and murder a man named William's son. It sounds like a sort of infanticide. A journalist of my acquaintance did move quite unconsciously from a place called Overstrand to a place called Overroads. When he had made this escape, he was very properly pursued by a voting card from Battersea, on which the political agent named Byrne asked him to vote for a political candidate named Burns. And when he did so, another coincidence happened after. And when he did so, another coincidence happened to him rather a spiritual than a material coincidence, a mystical thing, a matter of a magic number. For a sufficient number of reasons, the man I know went up to vote in Battersea in a drifting and even dubious frame of mind. As the train slid through swampy woods and sullen skies, there came into his empty mind those idle and yet awful questions which come when the mind is empty. Fools make cosmic systems out of them, Knaves make profane poems out of them. Men try to crush them like ugly lust. Religion 
is only the responsible reinforcement of common courage and common sense. Religion only sets up the normal mood of health against the hundred moods of disease. But there is this about such ghastly empty enigmas, that they always have an answer to the obvious answer, the reply offered by daily reason. Suppose a man's children have gone swimming. Suppose he is suddenly throttled by the senseless fear that they are drowned. The obvious answer is, only one man in a thousand has his children drowned. But a deeper voice, deeper being as deep as hell, answers, and why should not you be the thousandth man? What is true of tragic doubt is also true of trivial doubt. The voter's guardian devil said to him, If you don't vote today, you can do fifteen things which will quite certainly do some good somewhere. Please a friend, please a child, please a maddened publisher. And what good do you expect to do by voting? You don't think your man will get in by one vote, do you? To this he knew the answer of common sense. But if everybody said that, nobody would get in at all. And then there came that deeper voice from Hades. But you are not settling what everybody shall do, but what one person on one occasion shall do. If this afternoon you went your way about more solid things, how would it matter, and who would ever know? Yet somehow the voter drove on blindly through the blackening London roads, and found somewhere a tedious polling station, and recorded his tiny vote. The politician for whom the voter had voted got in by 555 votes. The voter read this the next morning at breakfast, being in a more cheery and expansive mood, and found something very fascinating, not merely in the fact of the majority, but even in the form of it. There was something symbolic about the three exact figures. One felt it might be a sort of motto or cipher. In the great book of seals and cloudy symbols, there is just such a thundering repetition. Six hundred and sixty-six was the mark of the beast. Five hundred and fifty-five is the mark of the man. The triumphant tribune and citizen. A number so symmetrical as that really rises out of the region of science into the region of art. It is a pattern like the egg and dart ornament or the Greek key. One might edge a wallpaper or fringe a robe with a recurring decimal. And while the voter luxuriated in this light exactitude of the numbers, a thought crossed his mind, and he almost leapt to his feet. "'My good heavens!' he cried. "'I won that election, and it was won by one vote. But for me it would have been the despicable, broken-backed, disjointed, inharmonious figure 554. The whole artistic point would have vanished.' The mark of the man would have disappeared from history. It was I who, with masterful hand, seized the chisel and carved the hieroglyph, complete and perfect. I clutched the trembling hand of destiny when it was about to make a dull square four and forced it to make a nice curly five. Why, but for me, the cosmos would have lost a coincidence. After this outburst, the voter sat down and finished his breakfast. Ethan Dune Perhaps you do not know where Ethan Dune is. Nor do I, nor does anybody. That is where the somewhat somber fun begins. I cannot even tell you for certain whether it is the name of a forest, or a town, or a hill. I can only say that in any case it is of the kind that floats and is unfixed. If it is a forest, it is one of those forests that march with a million legs, like the walking trees that were the doom of Macbeth. If it is a town, it is one of those towns that vanish like a city of tents. If it is a hill, it is a flying hill, like the mountain to which faith lends wings. Over a vast dim region of England, this dark name of Ethan Dune floats like an eagle, doubtful where to swoop and strike, and indeed there were dark birds of prey enough over Ethan Dune wherever it was. 
But now Ethan Dune itself has grown as dark and drifting as the black drifts of the birds. And yet without this word, that you cannot fit with a meaning and hardly with a memory, you would be sitting in a very different chair at this moment, and looking at a very different tablecloth. As a practical modern phrase, I do not commend it. If my private critics and correspondents, in whom I delight, should happen to address me G. K. Chesterton, post restante Ethan Dune, I fear their letters would not come to hand. If two hundred commercial travellers should agree to discuss a business matter at Ethan Dune from five to five fifteen, I am afraid they would grow old in the district as white-haired wanderers. To put it plainly, Ethan Dune is anywhere and nowhere in the western hills. It is an English mirage, and yet but for this doubtful thing you would have probably no daily news on Saturday, and certainly no church on Sunday. I do not say that either of these two things is a benefit, but I do say that they are customs, and that you would not possess them except through this mystery. You would not have Christmas puddings, nor probably any puddings. You would not have Easter eggs, probably not poached eggs. I strongly suspect not scrambled eggs, and the best historians are decidedly doubtful about curried eggs. To cut a long story short, the longest of all stories, you would not have any civilization, far less any Christian civilization. And if in some moment of gentle curiosity you wish to know why you are the polished, sparkling, rounded, and wholly satisfactory citizen which you obviously are, then I can give you no more definite answer, geographical or historical, but only toll in your ears the tone of the uncaptured name Ethan Dune. I will try to state quite sensibly why it is as important as it is, and yet even that is not easy. If I were to state the mere fact from history books, numbers of people would think it equally trivial and remote, like some war of the Picts and Scots. The point, perhaps, might be put this way. There is a certain spirit in the world which breaks everything off short. There may be magnificence in the smashing, but the thing is smashed. There may be a certain splendor, but the splendor is sterile. It abolishes all future splendors. I mean, to take a working example, York Minister covered with flames might happen to be quite as beautiful as York Minister covered with carvings, but the carvings produce more carvings. The flames produce nothing but a little black heat. When any act has this cul-de-sac quality, it matters little whether it is done by book or sword, by a clumsy battle-axe or chemical bomb. The case is the same with ideas. The pessimist may be proud figure when he curses all the stars. The optimist may be an even prouder figure when he blesses them all. But the real test is not in the energy, but in the effect. When the optimist has said, all things are interesting, we are left free. We can be interested as much or as little as we please. But when the pessimist says, no things are interesting, it may be a very witty remark, but it is the last witty remark that can be made on the subject. He has burnt his cathedral. He has had his blaze, and the rest is ashes. The skeptic, like bees, give their one sting and die. The pessimist must be wrong because he says the last word. Now this spirit that denies and that destroys had at one period of history a dreadful epoch of military superiority. They did burn York Minister, or at least places of the same kind. Roughly speaking, from the 7th century to the 10th, a dense tide of darkness, of chaos, and brainless cruelty poured on these islands and on the western coasts of the continent, which well-nigh cut them off from all the white man's culture for ever. And this is the final human test, that the very chiefs of that vague age were remembered or forgotten according to how they had resisted this almost cosmic raid. Nobody thought of the modern nonsense about races. Everybody thought of the human race and its highest achievements. Arthur was a Celt, 
and may have been a fabulous Celt, but he was a fable on the right side. Charlemagne may have been a Gaul or a Goth, but he was not a barbarian. He fought for the tradition against the barbarians, the Nihilists, and for this reason also, for this reason, in the last resort only, we call the saddest and in some ways the least successful of the Wessex kings by the title of Alfred the Great. Alfred was defeated by the barbarians again and again. He defeated the barbarians again and again, but his victories were almost as vain as his defeats. Fortunately, he did not believe in the time spirit or the trend of things or any such modern rubbish, and therefore kept pegging away. But while his failures and his fruitless successes have names still in use, such as Wilton, Basing, and Dashdown, that last epic battle which really broke the barbarian has remained without a modern place or name, except that it was near Chippenham, where the Danes gave up their swords and were baptized. No one can pick out certainly the place where you and I were saved from being savages forever. But the other day, under a wild sunset and moonrise, I passed the place which is best reputed as Ethan Doon, a high, grim upland, partly bare and partly shaggy, like that savage and sacred spot in those great imaginative lines about the demon lover and the waning moon. The darkness, the red wreck of sunset, the yellow and lurid moon, the long fantastic shadows actually created that sense of monstrous incident which is the dramatic side of landscape. The bare grey slopes seemed to rush downhill like routed hosts, the dark clouds drove across like riven banners, and the moon was like a golden dragon, like the golden dragon of Wessex. As we crossed the tilt of the torn heath, I saw suddenly between myself and the moon a black, shapeless pile higher than a house. The atmosphere was so intense that I really thought of a pile of dead Danes with some phantom conqueror on the top of it. Fortunately, I was crossing these wastes with a friend who knew more history than I, and he told me that this was a barrow older than Alfred older than the Romans, older perhaps than the Britons, and no man knew whether it was a wall or a trophy or a tomb. Ethan Doon is still a drifting name, but it gave me a queer emotion to think that, sword in hand, as the Danes poured with the torrents of their blood down to Chippenham, the great king may have lifted up his head and looked at that oppressive shape suggestive of something, and yet suggestive of nothing. He may have looked at it as we did, and understood it as little as we. The end of chapters 28 through 30